This is the Chronicles Podcast, a production of Chronicles Magazine, the original outlet for paleoconservative thought and a bastion of the authentic right in America. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of the Chronicles Magazine podcast. Paul Gottfried joins me today to talk with Amy Wax, the courageous Penn Law School professor, where she's recently come under fire for expressing views and opinions at odds with the new woke orthodoxy. Unfortunately, we had some video difficulties with my own video feed, so that will not be part of the episode. But with that out of our way, my first question to Amy was to have her summarize what is happening with her at the university. Well, it's it's kind of a long saga, so I'll I'll be very brief. I um, I've kind of been a thorn in the side of of my university and faculty for a while because I am, you know, an open openly conservative professor. I don't think my views have really changed much, but of course, as the university and academia has moved decisively left, I am considered more and more extreme. Um, it really all started when I wrote an op-ed in the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer co-wrote it actually, praising bourgeois values, saying that uh, the loss of bourgeois values has really hurt our country and pointing out that not all cultures are alike in their um, ability and opportunity to contribute to our highly technological society. Uh, And that's why it's a good idea that most people adopt these values. And that created a firestorm. It was accused of being racist, white supremacist, the usual litany of vague, never defined terms. Um, one of my colleagues in particular sort of spearheaded this effort to tar me. The dean, of course, condemned me, the students petitioned to get rid of me. Uh, and that started this whole snowballing process of trolling where people started clawing through my record, trying to find other infractions somebody found like a one minute clip on Glenn Lowry where I had been put a regular guest on his blogging heads in which I said that, you know, black students are generally not distributed evenly in the class in terms of their performance. I'd rarely seen black students at the very top of the class that created another firestorm, Mm -hmm. which, you know, is risible because of course, affirmative action is known to produce that result. Uh, and it's just widely understood why this is controversial is is really mysterious. But by then, wokeism has sort of caught on. And of course, wokeism forbids uh, any such statement. Wokeism requires that we indulge the fairy tale that all groups are equally skilled, equally capable, both you know in their potential and in their actual achievement. So I violated that precept. Uh, and I won't bore you with additional remarks that they latched on to, things I had said at conferences and podcasts, et cetera, uh, as part of my extramural speech that they found offensive. Finally, under a lot of pressure, my dean filed formal charges against me, saying I had behi- violated Penn Law's behavioral norms, even though everything I did was just expressing my opinion and, you know, pure speech. And eventually he tacked on some fantastical claims that I had said certain things to students like at a reception 10 years ago, oh, you're a beneficiary of affirmative action because you're a double Ivy, which I never said, but even if I did, it's not clear what's wrong with it. Uh, Stuff along those lines. Um, Only one remark, even in class is alleged, and that remark is, you know, obviously made up Mm -hmm. something about Mexican men tending to harass women. This is back before Trump said anything about Mexican men. So it truly is a process of projection. Mm -hmm. Anyway, all of this stuff was piled into the indictment against me. uh, And procedure of what's going on now is we're wrangling over when a hearing will take place, whether this charges will proceed, Uh, whether the grievance committee has to hear my case first because I filed a grievance against my dean for for compromising my academic freedom by pursuing me. So there's sort of two two charges that are in the air here. Uh, Really, it's just about to sort of take off. 
this case. It's taken a whole year. There's other twists and turns. There was an investigation into me that, you know, pretty much exonerated me of any bias. But the dean keeps accusing me of bias. Mm -hmm. um, the whole thing is this kind of mess of star chamber, one-sided kangaroo court allegations. Uh, and the school just seems totally oblivious to basic fundamentals of academic freedom and free speech, to my procedural rights, uh, you know, to truth, to rigor, to consistency. They contradict each other themselves all over the place. Nobody cares. Nobody's calling them out. Um, I'm sort of uh, enmeshed in this nightmare now of Penn being a judge in its own case. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as I can tell, they're going to continue to pursue this case against me. And we'll see what happens. Anything could happen. I mean, I could get anything from a slap on the wrist to fired and stripped of tenure. This really is unprecedented because they have never pursued a, pr a professor for her speech and opinions before. I want to get to the meaning of it all, but just real quick, with your general colleagues, is there a, an atmosphere of just they don't care, it doesn't really mean anything to them, or do you feel like people are scared to go up against the woke mob? Well, there's a handful of colleagues who, you know, are openly on my side, and, and well, at least privately they are. They've, they've continued to be friendly to me, and I socialize with them. None of them have spoken out publicly. Uh, the other professors, you know, just avert their eyes. When I walk down the hall, there's this kind of atmosphere of fear and furtiveness and, you know, uh, oh, we can't talk about it. Of course, you know, their excuse is, well, there's an ongoing procedure. But in fact, it's really completely antithetical to the kind of openness and discussion that ought to take place at a law school. This is an incredibly important topic. You know, free speech, free expression, academic free expression, these are vital central topics and they are, there is silence. Mm -hmm. There is absolute silence. They pretend that none of this is happening. I don't know what their thinking process is. I think it's partly fear. It's partly just not wanting to be bothered. It's partly a kind of post-Trump Manichaean attitude, which is if you depend, defend a person's right to say something, then you're defending what they're saying. The inability to separate those two uh, has come more and more to the fore. Um, it's, it's really a remarkable situation uh, that is part and parcel of the, the decline of our universities and our law schools. It, it is just emblematic of it, really, what's going on, which means which is nothing's going on. People are just pretending this isn't happening. Mm -hmm. essentially i want i want to know more about the overall atmosphere of academia i mean paul you you i mean this was your world as well mm -hmm. did you mm -hmm. ever sense anything like this i mean obviously you saw that it was coming decades ago but you know do, do you have any perspective on what's going on with her well you know actually despite the fact that i've written books on wokeness <laughs> um listening to amy and to others describing their experience um, has convinced me that I really don't have the whole picture, uh, that there's a kind of insanity that has been let loose, uh, the, and the, uh, the fullness of which I do not grasp anymore. Um, I, I can understand, I, I know we're sort of living in a post-liberal age, that the liberal values that define Western civilization, what Amy and I both, you know, look back at very nostalgically as the bourgeois age may be coming to an end, it is what has replaced it that is totally insane. Uh, this is my problem as, as, as an intellectual historian. Uh, I can understand fascism, Marxism. Um, I don't believe these things. I think they cause problems, but at least there's some kind of rational core. Um, what we're now seeing, is, as I said, is just, is just total lunacy. It's like, tomorrow, I cannot use a pronoun or I cannot use this person's name because it's sexist or racist or something, or something else is going to be prohibited or something else I'm not going to be allowed to, to say because it hurts some designated minority, uh, even an imaginary minority. And I'm sort of wondering if Amy perhaps can understand better than I do, although I've written books on this subject, how did this wokeness come along and 
why has it been so pervasive in our university system? Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, I, I have my own theory about where wokeness comes from. I, I you know, it's not necessarily a definitive theory, but what I'm seeing is just the complete abandonment of the sort of fundamental enlightenment Western tenets mm -hmm. of intellectual integrity, rigor, uh, consistency, proof, evidence, intellectual honesty. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of that stuff is just kind of melted into air and out the window. Why? It's whiteness. You know, whiteness mm -hmm. has to go. Ho, 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 Western Civ has to go. Mm -hmm. And it is kind of a, the takeover of a multicultural, you know, uh, kind of even pan-African mm -hmm. ethos mm -hmm. as superior to and better than it, it is a replacement theory on the intellectual level we are going to replace everything that the west represents you know all of the intellectual values that the west represents and the rule of law values and everything that comes out of it mm -hmm. with this kind of emotion laden hysterical um feelings based irrational uh you know impetus or a set of 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 norms and understandings that can only be described as primitive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a very strong component of feminization. It's kind of what I call a mean girls gynocracy that has taken over these places with all of the values that, you know, women elevate over the traditional masculine values. Um, that is, you know, feelings, a kind of Manichaean division of the world into mm -hmm. evil and good. Um, the the premium on safety and on protecting the vulnerable and the oppressed uh and we know who the special people are in that system um so we and and it's it's so striking i mean you know at the the you know, hell bent on destruction for everything that's been built of course they enjoy all the fruits mm -hmm. of what's been built they're using their iphones and their computers they want the best of medical care um the financial system, prosperity it generates, they're enjoying it to the hilt uh, while bad-mouthing it up and down the line. Uh, and I think it it really comes from, at the end of the day, racial guilt. I think at the core of wokeness mm -hmm. is racial guilt and the kind of civil rights movement spun out of control because mm -hmm. there was this naive... Uh, idealistic expectation that the civil rights movement and all the correctives would yield equal outcomes for different groups because all men are equal and all groups are equal in their ability, their skill, capacity, their interests um, and competencies and the like. And, you know, that has proven not to be true, at least certainly not to be true so far. And, in, you know, of course, the focus here is on blacks, to some extent Hispanics, black uh, life has in some ways, you know, just slid backwards. I mean, the family is more of a mess than it ever was. Black crime continues to be extremely high. Mm -hmm. Skill gaps and test gaps are still there. You know, the LSAT gap hasn't really budged in 40 years. Um, it's just this sense of outrage and frustration that this idealized future, this fairy tale future, mm -hmm has not come to pass. And now the idea is, well, we're going to bring it about by force majeure. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, there's this fundamental axiom. Well, the cause has to be racism. That is the only acceptable cause, right? I was just reading an essay by John Stadden in Academic Questions in which he looked at this proposal by John Darity down in Duke to create a new stratification economics. And what would be the core commitment of stratification economics? A bypass of all attempts to explain disparities by anything other than racism. That would be the fundamental precept of this new science. Now, of course, that isn't social science in any way, shape or form because it's dogma. It says, you know, we're not gonna follow evidence or results. We're not going to look at alternative hypotheses. We're not going to do controls. We're just going to posit that the cause of everything is 
this nefarious racist white society mm -hmm. that is what we're left with with wokeness no other explanation is acceptable and you know white society has to correct this situation one way or another by hook or by crook even if it results in the total destruction of white society the meritocracy intellectual integrity intellectual honesty social science as we know it uh the university all of that sweep it away we need to bring about racial equality one way or another so that i think is the story of where wokeness comes from and why it is so incredibly dangerous and destructive i consider it just absolutely dangerous and destructive of everything worthwhile and valuable. I know Paul has an opinion on this one, but I'm actually curious, do you think the people at the university believe their own ideology here? Or do you think it's kind of just used as a justification to get what they really want, which is increased political power and domination and the elimination of sort of these Eurocentric or Euro backdrop type ideas and I mean, Paul's talked about this a lot, but do they believe their own myths that they're pushing forth? I have no idea. Okay, when, when I hear the kind of all they want is power, mm -hmm. I always ask the question, you know, yeah, sure, people want power in and of itself, but mm -hmm. more often they want power in order to accomplish something mm -hmm. that they think needs to be accomplished. And that's where the ideology comes in. And that's where, you know, part of me really thinks these people do believe this stuff and they are just mm -hmm. willfully blind willfully blind to all the evidence around them that the fundamentals of wokeness are just plain false i mean they're just have no basis but of course the notion that one seeks the truth one you know examines precepts for falsehood one it looks at the evidence all of that stuff is what they're trying to get rid of that's whiteness i mean it's white it's turtles all the way down for you know the kinds of fundamentals that they just want to sweep away do they really believe it i you know i just it's first of all none of them will talk to me so we are <laughs> kind of in a way siloed in our own little worlds here uh they don't want to be challenged they don't want to have to explain all the contradictions of the stuff they believe and there's another thing, which is they think to even discuss it and bring it out in the open and question it is an affront mm -hmm. to the poor, fragile, delicate minorities that they're trying to protect. Right. So there is this this idea that we can't expose these people to any sort of challenge and certainly not to any kind of intellectual challenge, because frankly, you know, we know and they know that they're not up to it, mm -hmm. you know, so intellectual challenge. And you see this in, in the university every day of the week. You know, you have minority students, you know, running away in tears from situations that might question the sort of precepts that they rely on, the fundamentals. They they can't deal with it. Um, so that's part and parcel of protecting the special people protecting the special people requires shielding them from the ordinary demands of intellectual life you, you know what, what you have said uh is something that i agree with entirely and the reason the reason i mentioned this is that i've been engaged in two discussions recently one with a young englishman who was a very devout christian who's convinced that the our problems we face are mostly metaphysical um, and uh, also, I had a long, uh, a long debate with Sam Francis that went on for about 20 years, uh, in which I argued that the left is interested in much more than power. They actually, in many cases, believe the stuff that they're telling yeah. us, which really yeah. scares me. Because if all they wanted was power, I could understand this. But if they really believe that using a pronoun is... Uh, an act of racial violence or, or sexual violence and so forth, uh, there's absolutely no way you can deal with these people because they're, they're lunatics. And th th this is basically the position that I have arrived at. Um, and I agree with what Amy is saying. I think race is at the bottom of this. 
uh, the hatred of the white race and the civilization that it produced for the, the biblical and the envy, the, the envy and, and the anger right. yeah, that we have there. produced this this obviously superior people go berserk when you use the word superior. This is like, you know, the left's rules. You mm -hmm. can't rank civilizations in terms of their achievements. That's mm -hmm. verboten. Like who says that's their rule, mm -hmm. right? That's not my rule. But yeah, I think a lot of people believe this stuff on some level, but also they've done a great job of intimidating other people mm -hmm. to not question it. The people who are not the true believers who might harbor some doubts. It has now become a strong norm that you are not allowed to express those doubts either openly or in certain ways, mm -hmm. right? You can't, so for example, the rule that you can't praise Western Civ, that you can't point out all the achievements of Western Civ, that you can't make that part of the curriculum, that you can't teach young people about it. You know, I had Glenn Lowry, who I really like and admire, say that's chauvinism. And, you know, look up chauvinism in the dictionary. It says excessive pride. I don't mm -hmm. think that's excessive pride. Mm -hmm. We can differ on whether we think it's excessive pride. I think it is appropriate pride it is meat pride if we don't have the appropriate level of pride in our outsized achievements across the board then we will not appropriately value what we have created and preserve protect and defend it right and that is really what we are teaching young people today or rather not teaching them we are affirmatively forbidden from teaching them the right level of admiration for Western Civ, let's call it what it is, right? European civilization, yeah, white people civilization. You're not allowed to do that. And that screws up the whole system. We talked about, you know, where this kind of came from. Where do you think this is going? I, I presume that you're not really optimistic, <laughs> you know, holistically about the, the future of academic freedom and the future of the ability to defend um, what you call Western civilization. I don't see this slowing down at all. It doesn't seem like there's any meaningful um, legal opposition that could possibly confront things where they are. Well, I think, yeah, the laws, the laws leverage here is certainly limited. Um, there is the First Amendment for state-run universities, right? Not for private universities. It doesn't apply to private universities. The problem with the First Amendment for state-run universities is a double-edged sword. It both protects the entrenched ideologies, which are highly entrenched, mm -hmm. right, and have ironclad control, like, you know, the whole CRT gang. Uh, but it also provides an opening for dissenters and individuals who question that it, it offers some protection to them of course they have to get a foothold in the institutions before they can be protected and that's the challenge those are the challenges that people like DeSantis is is grappling with right mm -hmm. how to do that how to bring balance to the system and it's it's very difficult it requires a lot of political will and it also requires people to know what time it is and that this is should be a big priority because we are talking about educating young people. We are talking about uh, indoctrinating young people actually and the madrasa-like atmosphere in which they are being educated. I think the private universities are really a tough nut to crack because we don't have really hardly any legal leverage there. We could acquire it if Congress mm -hmm. would enact a First Amendment guarantee for private universities as part of their spending power because they do funnel vast sums of money to these private universities so they could extend Title VI and say, you know, you can't discriminate, but you also have to honor the First Amendment. But that's no good if there's no political will to enforce it. Mm -hmm. So you need, you know, executives, presidents, Congress people, governors who will say, this is a priority, head of civil rights, divisions and you know those those institutions are controlled by lefties mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. there are a few points of light my students you know they know what's going on they they see all of this they see the case against me as a warning to others you know as a way to intimidate people and shut them down and make sure that they don't speak out because they will fear that what is happening to me will happen to them they they are very cynical about 
what the university is doing and all the lies they tell and all the double talk that is, you know, routine, routinely coming out of central campus. So that's encouraging, but there aren't that many of them. And most of them are male. The women, you know, have a really hard time sort of <laughs> deconforming themselves from from the current fads and fashions. That's been my observation. Um, we have people like Chris Rufo who are leading rebellions at the K through 12 level because there's a tremendous amount of abuse taking place at the K through 12 level. And even liberal parents are rebelling against some of it, especially mm -hmm. the sexualization of school, of education, of childhood. You know, the fact that these gender issues, these queer weird polymorphous perverse ideas are everywhere now they're seen as normal you know and part of giving people you know the full picture and all, all sorts of nonsense to excuse it um i personally and i've said this think there should be zero sex education in the schools this mm -hmm. is the realm for parents for values for morals it gives the government and its arm, the schools, way too much power to have them even address this stuff. When I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, the teachers wouldn't touch this stuff. Mm -hmm. They knew that they weren't supposed to talk about it mm -hmm. ever, ever, okay? And that opened up all of this horizons of time to learn real stuff, like geography, you know, and the Constitution and history and you know, reading and writing and science. They didn't spend their time on this crap. Uh, so I, I would like to go back. I am a total reactionary when it comes to this, but I think a lot of parents are too. They just don't have the tools and the wherewithal to explain why what is happening is dysfunctional and inappropriate. I think more and more they are acquiring those tools and understandings so that that is a point of light that is a reason for hope but i think other than that there isn't very much reason for optimism i mean mm -hmm. all of the opinion shaping institutions have been taken over by this bizarre ideology let me say one more thing mm -hmm. even religious schools have been taken over mm -hmm. by it mm -hmm. i got a alumni magazine uh, i have a new york apartment that used to be occupied by someone who went to some Catholic school in Queens, Bishop Malloy High School or something, and the alumni magazines keep coming. The last one was, you know, because Queens is a immigration community. I mean, there's scarcely a white person left in Queens, as far as I could tell. Um, these schools have adopted hook, line, and sinker, the whole multicultural diversity mm -hmm. ideology, mm -hmm. because they think that that's the way that can serve their students. You know, and that is just so weak minded. The way the reason their parents are sending the students there is to get straight up post enlightenment Western Civ style education and mm -hmm. values, not all this multicultural crap. They they they're just going down the wrong path. Um they're completely misguided. They think they've got to jump on this bandwagon. But they don't. They absolutely don't. There are a few Jewish schools in the Philly area that I know about that some of my friends' kids send their children to, grandkids go to, that are very, very traditional, um, extremely so. And they don't teach any of this stuff. And they don't teach about dinosaurs either. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I think know, that's a fair trade-off. <laughs> I think it's a fair trade-off. I, I, would, I would not have them teach evolution as long as they don't teach about, you know, queer gender fluidity or what <laughs> how to put condoms on a banana or whatever it is they're teaching them right i I, rem I remember years ago uh i had a colleague who would not vote for pat buchanan in some primary <laughs> because he wasn't sure that buchanan believed in the theory of evolution right and i pointed out that you know i generally do accept the theory of evolution but uh that is not one of the qualifications if, uh, for uh, for president for the the presidency. He's good on the other issues. 
Right, right. You can't, you, you'd have to take what you can get. Right. Um, my view about the dinosaurs is, you know, I could teach my kids about the dinosaurs. It's interesting because I recently heard a semi-woke expert on K through 12 say, well, you know, these parents who come in and say they don't want these books about homosexuality and queerness and gayness and gender fluidity and transgenderism in the schools, they don't want their kids taught. They're depriving other kids of the experience of learning about these important <laughs> things. And my view is, honey, you have it totally backwards. Mm -hmm. If parents want their kids to read about transgenderism and queerness and homosexuality, they can go to the damn library and take the books out mm -hmm. and every night sit down at bedtime with them and read them these books. Nobody is stopping them. Nobody is stopping them. Absolutely. So, you know, it really depends on who gets the default presumption as far as I'm concerned. And I have good and compelling reasons why the parents who want to control what kids hear about this stuff because it's about values and morals and the kind of person you are and the kind of life you're going to lead and it is no business of the government those parents should get the default. Mm -hmm. are, are you at all struck by the fact that John Fetterman is our senator in Pennsylvania? <laughs> and well, I, I, didn't I, vote I, for I mentioned this because there were a lot of these, you know, suburban housewives and mothers who voted for this idiot and uh, brain damage uh, uh, radical. And this brings up the question of whether, you know, these, these women, uh, these, uh, uh, educated women are sufficiently disillusioned with wokeness, you know, to to reject uh, a brain damage representative of that ideology. Uh, I'm I'm also um, wondering whether you know groups that are willing to come to your defense and come to the defense of other people defending intellectual freedom and inquiry um, are not going to take fallback positions in the end. Um, and this is something you see on Fox News. If you want someone to attack uh, uh, gender reassignment, you bring on a lesbian who complains about it, or you have a black who only blacks are allowed to complain about black excesses and so forth. Uh, so what I call the sort of a fallback position in which you, you fight only the latest abuse, right? Or the, or the most outrageous abuse, but you let the other ones stand uh, because you sort of give up on them. You know, we're not going to be able to get, to get to return everything to the way it was 40 or 50 years ago, but at least we can address the um, uh, the latest abuse, the latest complaint. Uh, and I, I think this may work against people who are want to defend traditional education in the United States. Yes. Well, I mean, the latter, I think, is complicated. I, I would just going back to what you said initially and the Fetterman phenomenon. I think what's going on is a few things. First of all, you know, your your soccer mom, your suburban housewife type, who is quote unquote educated in that some of them have graduated from the madrasas, aka college. Um, <laughs> they they consider themselves sophisticated and educated, and precious few are about about uh, politics. They are mm -hmm. really primitive. Um, that all the cliches about how men are more interested in politics and more sophisticated about it you know i think they they've all they're all true in my experience i mean I agree <laughs> the understanding and uh about politics is just so so basic and mm -hmm. and where that basic uh understanding goes which is emotion led it's emotion laden right is uh the the republicans are evil people they're bad people we don't want to have anything to do with them because they're mean and then there's trump and trump's racist and sexist and this is and that is and if you ask them to actually give an example they can't but this is what they've read in the new york times and this is what they've heard on tv right so if we're good people if we're nice people we have to vote for democrats and it even doesn't really matter who they are they're just democrats the democrats are are the party of if the baby's crying pick it up if people are suffering give them something mm -hmm. right that's that's the whole female ethos right? it's it's the values of the nursery and the kindergarten mm -hmm. that's what i call it and you know you can't run a nation on that basis just as gk chesterton said you can't run a nation by the sermon on the mount mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but but it doesn't matter so you know then does it matter that fetterman is you know severely impaired let's put it that way that he can't really do his job no because 
number one, what really matters is the party. Mm -hmm. And he's just, you know, a placeholder. Number two, uh, they're into this whole now disability rights thing. Like, you know, people whose brains are gorked out are just as good as people who are, you know, intact in every way. And we can't make these distinctions because that's discriminatory and it's mean. And, you know, so, so that whole ideology, that whole set of ideas, if you want to call them ideas, um, you know, the Fetterman thing just takes full advantage of that. Uh, but of course, if you just step back, it's ridiculous. Even these people who are endorsing it don't take it seriously because when push comes to shove and it's their, their oncologist or their pilot or, you know, someone who's, you know, where it's a life or death matter or a matter of safety, they go for the best. So there's a tremendous amount of inconsistency and hypocrisy here and just very superficial thinking very very superficial thinking i once again i'm dumping on the female sex but i can you know count on one hand the number of women i know who are sophisticated about politics and knowledgeable and they're all on the right mm -hmm. you know they're all kind of right-wing intellectuals uh maybe there are some left-wing intellectual women who are in that category i can't think of any uh, maybe you can think of any. Uh, oh, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, most women, women I've met who are politically intelligent are all saying. right. I can think of very few exceptions. Um, yeah. And uh, I wonder why this is the case. I, it, it, it may be that these women are more reflective or are, are less driven by... Well, emotion. they're dissidents. They're, they're, uh, they're renegades, you know, mm -hmm. because they are... Uh, their thinking and their examination has led them away from what is ordinarily expected of women, which is that they'll be, you know, bleeding heart, tender minded lefties. Um, and, you know, to the extent that they have any ideas in their head, they get it from the New York Times, which is full of lies mm -hmm. and, you know, full of stupid arguments that, you know, any person with any rigor can see through immediately. Um, but that is the sum total of where they get their information. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, I, you know, I'm searching, it's like searching for the, the virtuous man in Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm searching for the, the left-wing female intellectual who actually knows something and, you know, can, uh, understands the other side's arguments, can argue their way out of a paper bag. I'm coming up empty here, uh, very much coming up empty. No, I, I, I think there, there are um, uh, female pinheads who represent the Republican Party. You see them on Fox every night. Um, uh, I mean, we, we can see that. But uh, yeah, there are also pinheads on both sides. Right. But you also yeah. have intelligent women on the right. And I find yeah. very few uh, women, women who women may be intelligent, but they're not politically intelligent or they don't articulate political positions very effectively or coherently unless they. Uh, Right. Uh, unless you find them on the right. That has been my experience. And I, you know, I'm, I'm certainly taking into account my own bias. But, uh, you know, if I encountered an intelligent Marxist woman, she'd be an intelligent Marxist woman. There have been Rosa Luxemburg was a highly intelligent Marxist. It was a long time ago. A long time ago. Right. It was over no, it's... years ago that she was killed. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. So um, that's the other reason for my pessimism, I think, um, is that we have uh, now a kind of highly feminized society in which women have been given more and more power, more and more control. Uh, and, you know, women are uh, by and large not political animals. I mean, Aristotle mm -hmm. knew it. And uh, I think that that wisdom has uh, been around for a very, very long time. Um, and so we necessarily become less and less sophisticated, capacious, knowledgeable, uh, you know, I, I mean, how many women will sit and read a book of history, a biography of Bismarck, uh, whatever, uh, something like that, mm -hmm. you know, a history of uh, the, the First World War um, of Britain, you know, Simon Heffer's book about the Victorians, how many women mm -hmm. are going to really inform themselves and steep themselves in the complexity of political history uh, and the past. 
Um, I just, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an academic, I'm an intellectual, so I should know those people. Um, but on the right, you know, we have Amity Schles, we have uh, Heather McDonald, um, we have uh, Kay Heimowitz, um, we have other people like that who, who really know their stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and you can talk to them and, and uh, they will sort of see the issues in the round. But anyway, I was going back to why I'm pessimistic. Um, you know, we now have the mean girl gynocracy controlling journalism, controlling the university, uh, all the opinion shaping institutions, entertainment, the entertainment world, the corporate world, nonprofits, uh, the funding agencies. Um, these are highly influential centers of power in our society. Uh, and they are more and more run along feminized lines with, you know, the values of the nursery and the kindergarten coming to the fore, being the paramount values. Uh, and that, you know, doesn't bode well for conservative influence, for Republican uh, influence or dominance. Um, I'm amazed that the Republicans have as much power as they do, mm -hmm. certainly at the state level, at the local level. They still have a lot of voters in their camp. Um, I don't know how much longer that will continue. I'm very worried about the younger generation, which leans left. A big reason why they lean left, okay, is the educational system, mm -hmm. which indoctrinates them in these lefty ideas, these woke ideas, every chance it gets mm -hmm. at every turn. I mean, there is almost no space for fundamentally conservative traditional ideas and notions and works and readings and, you know, intellectuals uh, just take take black studies for example where we've just had a kind of food fight about the ap test with desantis challenging uh the ap course sorry the ap advanced placement course in african-american studies in florida if you take a close look at that course it leans so far left it's amazing it doesn't topple over i mean conservative black voices are absent they they just don't appear. They, people like Thomas Sowell or Glenn Lowry, you know, or um, Shelby Steele or um, Woodson. What's his name? I'm not sure of his first name. Uh, they, they are Robert Woodson. Robert, Robert Woodson. Uh, those people don't even get a mention. Right. I mean, you would think in a fair course, you would they would get half time at least they'd actually probably get more in my yeah, do you think that do you think they may be overplaying their hand i turn on my tv set and i notice everybody is black and <laughs> everyone in the advertisements is black and mary queen of scots is black and Henry <laughs> the Eighth, they're all black okay and i'm looking at this and i notice that even family members of mine who are woke female woke family members um say you know this is too much it's ridiculous. Uh, right. I mean, and, you know, if you go to school and all you get, you, you know, you, everybody's being uh, taught about sexual reassignment. Uh, even these uh, leftist mothers uh, may think that this is this is going too far. Do, do you think the left is in danger at some point of overplaying its hand uh, because it pushes its message too obtrusively? I really don't know. I mm -hmm. really don't know. I think there are the seeds of rebellion are there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they have so cleverly consolidated their hold over all of these various institutions and power mm -hmm. centers. And they've done mm -hmm. it with a few incredibly aggressive activists, mostly female, mm -hmm. who are willing to, you know, call names, label people. And, you know, the minute you get the racist label attached to you, you know, people just quail in fear. They're terrified mm -hmm. of that. This is just a technique that allows you to control what other people say and do. But I agree with you, it's completely ridiculous. I mean, I, I often chuckle at the ads on TV which show, you know, a black man married to a white woman in an 
upper <laughs> class picket fence house. And this is like, you know, first of all, this represents 0.00001% of the population, <laughs> if that. <laughs> Secondly, it is, it's amusing because it is the wages of hypocrisy. This is the homage that vice pays to virtue. Mm -hmm. They never show blacks the way they really are, right? <laughs> a bunch of single moms with a bunch of guys who you know float in and out uh kids by different men um you know they they don't show the reality that is the reality of black life in america mm -hmm. not you know a thin black woman married to a white upper middle class white guy <laughs> in greenwich connecticut it's it's really ludicrous but madison avenue feels like that is the way they have to show blacks mm -hmm. you know well that's that's good in the sense that they think there's something sort of suspect with showing a bunch of you know single moms without any man in sight they think that's suspect well that that that's heartening you know, because they're so dedicated to telling us that there's no difference and it doesn't really matter. Um, so there are these kind of remnants of traditional opinions and ideas, but they are doing their very best to stamp them out. You know, Amy, I actually, I appreciate your pessimism. And I think it, sometimes it requires, I mean, Spengler once said, you know, that optimism is cowardice. You know, and we, we can get all caught up in this fake fantasy optimism. Um, but pessimism really allows us to realize um, the depth and breadth of what was lost and the true reality of the fight that would be required to regain it. So, Paul, I, do you have any thoughts on the close on the uh, pessimism optimism front? I th although I think um, Amy is just is being realistic. I don't think she's being pessimistic at this point. No, I, I am a pessimist. I think she's a realist. Um, I don't really see any way out. And I think the, the mistakes that have been made or the lunacies that have been unleashed go back a long way. And I know we have these disagreements on the early phase of the civil rights movement, of, of which I'm much more critical than you uh, or Alex Riley or some other conservatives with whom I have, I have spoken. But I, I think Amy is being realistic. And, uh, I, I, you know, people complain about books that I write that I really don't give any way out. You know, I just lay out problems in my books. And I think it's very important to do that uh, because you have to understand the extent of the dilemma or problem that you're in in order to, in order to reach for uh, realistic solutions. Yeah, I think I am a realist. I'm, I'm disappointed. I would say my overwhelming uh, reaction and, and sentiment right now is disappointment, really disappointment at the people who are you know, the privileged people in our culture, I hate that word because it's a lefty word, right? But uh, people who are situated to um, push back against these terribly overtly destructive trends. And I'm, I'm amazed and shocked and that people don't see how destructive they are. At least they hide that they do. Or in the alternative, they're just indifferent and that to me is the ultimate sin. I think a lot of it is just sheer selfishness. Mm -hmm. We don't care about the coming generations. That is a modern malady. You know, Burke speaks of it. They don't care about the past. And frankly, they don't care about the future. Mm -hmm. and fewer and fewer are having children. So, you know, after I die, it's every man for himself. I promois la deluge. And uh, I, I detect really a lot of that. Um, just in closing, you know, some of my family members say uh, that what it will take is just a real shock to the system, you know, a war with China, um, some horrible cataclysm, uh, or the complete breakdown of our system. I think the problem is there's not going to be a complete breakdown of our system. It's going to be, as Hemingway says, gradually mm -hmm. and suddenly. Um, so I already see the cracks in things like our aviation system. You know, there are more and more incidents and mishaps. Sooner or later, there's going to be some big accidents because standards have fallen everywhere. The meritocracy is under attack. Competence is, is no longer valued. No one's willing to tell people they're not doing a good job. I see that in my day-to-day -day life. Uh, that is eventually going to have an effect but it's not really clear whether it's going to have 
the sufficiently cataclysmic effect to shake people out of some of these bad ideas. Though.